Heavenly Father, we just come to you tonight, and we thank you and praise you that we can come to you tonight. We thank you, Lord, that we've come into this place and gathered in your name, and no one has told us that we cannot, and we thank you for that privilege. We thank you for that honor. And Lord, I just ask you to please anoint me one more time. Please let the needful anointing rest on me tonight and enable me to just convey my heart um, to the precious ones who are in this room and all those who will watch by any media format in the days to come. Lord, we just love you and we praise you and we ask you to have your way with us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, for those of you, some, I don't know when you might watch this, but this is Thanksgiving week in the year 2020. And um, the title of tonight is Living in Thanksgiving. Living in Thanksgiving. I have to tell you that um, I feel as though this particular Thanksgiving might be the most poignant Thanksgiving that I have ever experienced in my life. So much has happened in this year. So much has happened. And um, so many plans are made and then changed. So many things uh, we, we look forward to, we have looked forward to with expectation and then not been able to follow through on them, not been able to do. Because this is Help for Hurting Women, I am always reminded of the theme scripture for Help for Hurting Women, which is 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4, which is a scripture of thanksgiving. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can give that same comfort to others that we have received from God. And the truth of it is <laughs> that um, the holidays can be real trouble. Trouble for our hearts, trouble in families, trouble in trying to make plans, when there are challenges in families, when there are broke, when there's brokenness, when we are separated from our families and we can't even be with them, um, it, it, there is so there are so many dynamics, and I am hoping. My hope is, my prayer is, um, the the series is called Hope for the Holidays, that I am hoping that if you are in an extremely challenging position right now in regard to Thanksgiving, that you will find comfort tonight, that you will be comforted tonight. Part of what happens, now I've, I've shared teaching like this many, many times in years past, and normally, normally the situation is that we have unrealistic expectations that we're seeing all kinds of ads about the perfect table and the perfect family and the perfect meal and, you know, and that we're supposed to be happy. Now, for those of us who have televisions and we're watching the commercials, that's really not so much what you're seeing this year. What you're seeing this year is about make the best of it because you're gonna be separated. It's gonna be challenging. Make the best of it. Well, you know, <laughs> Kelly made an interesting statement coming up. How many of you in here have the perfect family? <laughs> yeah, nobody, you know? And she said, you know, family times wouldn't be so difficult if it weren't for our families. <laughs> Well said, Kelly. <laughs> yeah, family times wouldn't be so difficult if it weren't for our families. All kinds of dynamics, not just with COVID, but with the, the, just the 
overweening situations in the United States of America right now. So much, so much. Well, several years ago, my team knows this. Those of you who've attended for a while, you've done Thanksgiving with me before, you know all about this. Some years ago, I was looking at a, at a Norman Rockwell painting. It, it is probably the most famous of all of the Norman Rockwell paintings, and you, you have it there. It is called Freedom from Want. Freedom from Want. And um, famous picture, I, you know, I've shared a couple years ago, this picture was on the, literally on the wrapping of Publix turkeys, if you can believe that. That's how famous this picture is, right? And uh, so those of you who know me and know the history here, I was looking at it and admiring the picture, and the Lord just really spoke to my heart and said, what's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture? Now, in the, <laughs> in the natural, I can tell you lots of things wrong with this picture. There's no coffee for starters right? Uh, well, where are the sides exactly? Um, are we only going to get pears and grapes and celery? I mean, seriously, you know? Um, but, but here you have everyone sitting around this table, right? Everyone's happy. Everyone's jovial. Everyone's just so, so excited. And, and I look at that turkey, honestly, I say this every time, how in the world do you carve a turkey like that at the table and not make a mess? I mean, come on, really? Have any of you ever carved a turkey? It's a mess. It's absolutely a mess. But um, it's interesting. And there are writers who talk about this. If you lo look at the lower right-hand corner of that picture, there is a guy who's looking directly at us, right? As if to say, isn't this all a bit much? right? Isn't this all a bit much? But, but just so you understand, you know, I love Norman Rockwell, so don't, that, that's not the issue. I do want you to understand that that was published in the Saturday Evening Post, not at Thanksgiving time. It was March, March 6th of 1943. March 6th of 1943, right flat in the middle of World War II. Families were not together. They were not together. It was a time very similar to now, but different circumstances. Norman Rockwell painted what we hope to have, what we would like to have, what our, our dreams would like to be. So show of hands, how many of you cannot be with family loved ones this year. You cannot be. Yeah. I mean, vast majority in this room. Vast majority in this room. And this is the reality of it. The reality is that there, there can be huge stress issues related to this. Because we're separated, there can be brokenness. Brokenness in our lives, and our homes, in, in our marriages broken relationships, and, and add on top of all of that the dynamics of 2020, not in just the United States, but in the world, the dynamics of COVID and, and what that is doing. And the reality is that we all have memories of uh, Thanksgiving's past, holidays past. I, uh, I did devotions this morning um, for the staff, and I asked the question, there, there were maybe 20, 20, 25 of us in there, lots of people decorating, uh, traveling, you know, doing different things, but there were maybe 25, and I asked, how many of you have good memories of Thanksgivings from your past? And there were three people in there who did not raise their hands. And I asked the question twice, because that is reality. For many of your lives, holiday time was war time in your home. Or holiday time was the time when you just absolutely could not engage because of dynamics in your life. 
perhaps addictions in your life. They, and, and then the flip side of that coin is good memories. I have wonderful memories growing up with my grandparents and my parents, and then my father left, and things changed. I have wonderful memories of holidays with my husband, who made the biggest deal out of every holiday possible, and it was glorious and wonderful, but then the pain when he was gone, and, 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 and missing him so much. So we have all those memories. We have loss of loved ones, death, and, or sometimes it's just abandonment. Sometimes it's just that we are really in a very difficult place financially, especially this year, because of the dynamics of income related to COVID. So it, it can, this can all just be a real challenge, a real challenge. Um, I'm a tradition person. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm going to get those traditions in during this year. I'm going to get it in. I'm going to be watching It's a Wonderful Life. I'm going to be watching it. There are going to be certain foods that, that I'm going to be eating during the holiday season. And, um, you know, Thanksgiving was always at our home when I was growing up. And then my mother, you always ask me about my mother and uh, how's my mother doing? And thank you for your love and your concern for her. And um, the very first time that she no longer was able to cook and we went to a restaurant was 2017. And that was such a challenge. It was so difficult just to make the change, just to do things differently from year to year. Um, I'm, we usually have our, our party, for those of you who are watching. We usually have a ministry party in here at, during the, the Christmas season. And people bring things in, and we share, and it's awesome. And I was just praying and saying, Lord, we can't do that. We just can't do that this year. Because some people just will not be uncomfortable. So, praise God, he gave me a great idea. You're probably going to be more blessed than the other way, you know. And that's, that's how God is. But the most important thing is that the Lord will help us through it all and help us to gain proper perspective. The holiday season, COVID, no COVID, is never going to be perfect. It isn't. It is never going to be perfect. But... The Lord has a plan for it to be good. He has a plan for it to be good. It was amazing. During devotions today, when we came to the end, I asked for a few people to just share something they, they were really thankful to God for, something that God had done specifically during this year. Specifically during this year. And it was amazing to me how many people were praising God that they had stayed well and stayed strong. And have you all still had no COVID cases? No COVID cases. That, that is stunning. Is it the same with the men? Same with the men? I mean, that is absolutely stunning. Stunning. And they're going to the stores, and they're interacting with people, and God is absolutely protecting them. I mean, that is amazing. That's amazing. So God will help us to understand the holidays are never going to be perfect, but he does have a plan for them to be good. And he, he will give us proper perspective um, in Ephesians 1, it talks about that we have the eyes of our heart. Ephesians 1, 18, the eyes of our heart, seeing clearly, and clearly what? The riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. In the saints. There's something wonderful about us being able to be together. Don't miss it. 
don't overlook it. Don't discount it. It's a blessing. And I thank God that we can be together. It says, I pray that the eyes of your heart, the very center and core of your being may be enlightened, flooded with light by the Holy Spirit, so that you will know and cherish the hope, the divine guarantee, the confident expectation to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. This is living in thanksgiving. Can you say amen? Living in thanksgiving. In 2 Corinthians 4, we are told that we're to fix our eyes on what is eternal. Probably never, never, ever have we needed to do this more. The news is a mess. Just let me tell you, the news is a mess. Every, I can turn the news on and endure it for about two minutes. And it's like, I, I just can't even listen to this. I cannot listen to this. I have to just intentionally fix my eyes on what is eternal. The, the word says to fix your mind on things above. More than ever, we need to do this. And Ephesians 2.6 says that literally, in the spirit, we are seated with Christ Jesus in the heavenly realms. And I always say, if you just get a picture of that in your mind, a view from the heavenlies, everything looks a whole lot different down here than how it looks to us when we're just looking around us. So proper perspective is incredibly important. So tonight, I want to talk to you from my heart. Why do we do Thanksgiving? Let's just get some proper perspective because it will bring comfort to us and it will help us to make, make our way through this week well, the way God would have it to be because what he has for us is good. So why Thanksgiving? Well, of course we thank the Lord for Jesus Christ, amen? And for our salvation, we thank him for our blessings. We thank him for those who are special in our lives. And I would challenge each one of you, go out of your way this week to thank somebody, to just tell them that you are thankful for them. Go out of your way to do that. And it will be a blessing. It'll be a blessing. Ladies, even those of you who are with each other all the time, you can intentionally go out of your way to just thank one another for something individual and special that is coming to you from another's life. Amen? But most importantly, we do thanksgiving to thank the Lord for our heritage of religious freedom in America. Can you say amen? Amen. Um, I, I'll tell you what, um, we cannot lose that perspective. We cannot. We must keep our spirit of gratitude and, and understand what it has to do with Thanksgiving. This is our oldest American national holiday. And I want you to understand, celebrate when you can, where you can, with whom you can because nothing about the date is sacred. Just celebrate when you can, right? So let me give you just a, a few fun facts. This came out in the news press in 2018, okay? Historians can't seem to pinpoint the first Thanksgiving dinner, but I'm gonna tell you what I believe it was. Some believe the first was served by the pilgrims along the New England coast in 1621, and others say, you know, give credit to the settlers of Virginia, Jamestown, and still others now claim, guess what, it was in Florida, right? I'm going to tell you, I believe the first one was with the pilgrims. Okay, here's one, Sarah Hale, who wrote Mary Had a Little Lamb, <laughs> is considered the money, the mother of the Thanksgiving celebration after she urged President Lincoln to make the day a national holiday. Isn't that cool? The one who wrote 
Mary had a little lamb. That's pretty cool, right? Thanksgiving was proclaimed a national holiday by President Lincoln in 1863, and then in 1939, President Roosevelt moved the holiday forward one week to the day that we now celebrate, the fourth Thursday in November, okay? Okay, how many of you know the best way to determine if a cranberry is ripe? No one, no one, no one? You see if it bounces. If it bounces, it's ripe, ready for the cooking. <laughs> uh, according to the survey by the National Turkey Foundation, 95% of Americans eat turkey on Thanksgiving. That's one of my traditions. I'm going to be eating turkey on Thanksgiving. How many of you hope to be eating turkey on Thanksgiving? Most tans are up in here. Okay, an estimated 50 million pumpkin pies are eaten on Thanksgiving. How many of you hope to get a little pumpkin pie on Thanksgiving? Yeah, me too. Amen. Uh, the average weight of the turkey purchased for Thanksgiving meal is 15 pounds, and that adds up to about 675 million pounds <laughs> of turkey consumed on one day, one day in the United States. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Now, did you know that only male or tom turkeys actually gobble? Females or hens cackle. <laughs> yep, alrighty then. <laughs> and Americans aren't the only ones who celebrate Thanksgiving. Our friends to the north, our Canadian friends who can't even come here this year, celebrate Thanksgiving the second Monday of October. So just a few fun facts, right? Now, so how did this all begin here? Well, I just wanna read you a few things. Those of you who've been with me, you've heard them before, but every time I read these, it blesses me. Every time. Thanksgiving in America, the tradition of Thanksgiving as a time to focus on God and his blessings dates back almost four centuries in America. While such celebrations occurred at Cape Henry, Virginia, as early as 1607, it is from the pilgrims that we derive the current tradition of Thanksgiving. The pilgrims left England on September 6, 1620, and for two months braved the harsh elements of a storm tossed sea. You know what? It just, it, it boggles my mind that they were in the North Atlantic in September because the weather is so rough and so difficult. But there were issues with their departure and finally they left on September 6, 1620. 102 of them left England and 103 arrived because a baby was born along the way, and they named the baby Oceanus. I think that's a good name, right? They named him after the ocean, yeah. After disembarking at Plymouth Rock, they had a prayer service and began building hasty shelters, but unprepared for a harsh New England winter. New England winters are nothing like England winters. England is surrounded by the sea, and it tempers the weather that they have, their weather system. The harsh New England winter, nearly half of them died before spring. They had all arrived, and then spring comes, and half of them are gone. Yet persevering in prayer, and assisted by helpful Indians, they reaped a bountiful harvest the following summer. The grateful pilgrims then declared a three-day feast in December of 1621 to thank God and to celebrate with their Indian friends America's first Thanksgiving festival. And this began a tradition in the New England colonies that slowly spread into other colonies. Now think of this. There was not one single person in that Thanksgiving celebration who had not suffered profound loss. 
they were close. They had lost mothers, fathers, children. There were widows, widowers, orphans. Not one of them had not suffered loss, and yet they chose to praise on purpose. They chose to thank God in the midst of their hardship. Can you say amen? Amen? So the second Thanksgiving, now the year was 1623, and the pilgrims had been in the New World for two and a half years. The first Thanksgiving of 1621 was only a memory by this time because this sovereign's drought was jeopardizing everything not even the Indians could remember anything like it. The settlers had planted more corn than before, but without any rainfall, <laughs> there would be no harvest. Daily they had prayed that God would send rain, but he hadn't answered. And as the psalmist did in Psalm 141, verse 1, they were begging God to hurry. And that's exactly what that verse says. Psalm 141, verse 1, O Lord, I am calling to you, please hurry. How many of you have ever prayed that prayer? Yeah. Please hurry. Listen when I cry to you for help. Accept my prayer as incense offered to you and my upraised hands as an evening offering. They were begging God to hurry. Finally, this set aside an entire day for prayer and worship. And as they went for worship, the heavens were as clear and the drought as likely to continue as it ever was. Yet when they left their meeting, the weather was overcast, the clouds gathered on all sides, and for the next 14 days, there were moderate showers of rain, according to Edward Winslow, one of the pilgrims. The Indians watched, and they were amazed at how the God of the new settlers had answered their prayers. And that year, after the harvest, a second Thanksgiving was celebrated with the Indians joining in as well. You know, to that I say, God, let us be like that. Let us be like that. Let us pray and believe you. And having done all to stand, to stand, and watch as you do signs and wonders, as you do miracles, and other people in our lives see it and know this has to be God. Amen? Can you say amen? This has to be God. This has to be God. And sometimes it's a circumstance. Sometimes it's changed life, right? This has to be God, and others see it. Um, I want you to know that uh, there's a lot of revisionist history going around about how this country was birthed, and I don't want you to buy the lies. Do not buy the lies. I want to read you just three quotes. These are from men who were all signers of the Declaration of Independence, all three of them, You'll recognize their names if you know your history at all. And so now in these, we're moving on to the 1700s, 1700s. So they all signed the Declaration of Independence on July 4th, 1776. So entered into the records of the Continental Congress on 1777, this was written by Samuel Adams and Richard Henry Lee. Congress recommends a day of thanksgiving and praise so that the people may express the grateful feelings of their heart and join their prayers that it may please God through the merits of Jesus Christ to forgive our sins and to enlarge his kingdom, which consents, consists in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? Amen. Re entered into the writings of Congress, Continental Congress, 1776. This one comes from Thomas Jefferson, 1779, when he was governor. I appoint 
a day of public thanksgiving to Almighty God to ask him that he would pour out his Holy Spirit on all ministers of the gospel, that he would spread the light of Christian knowledge through the remotest corners of the earth, and that he would establish these the United States upon the basis of religion and virtue. Amen? Come on, let me hear you say amen. Amen. These are our founding fathers. And then of course, there's John Hancock. Governor John Hancock, 1790. I appoint a day of public thanksgiving and praise to render to God the tribute of praise for his unmerited goodness toward us by giving to us the holy scriptures which are able to enlighten and make us wise to eternal salvation and to pray that he would forgive our sins and cause the religion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to be known, understood, and practiced among all the people of the earth. Can you say hallelujah? Isn't that absolutely stunning? I mean, that is absolutely stunning. So then we move on to the 1800s. And I want you to know that I have given you Lincoln's original 1863 Thanksgiving proclamation because of all the proclamations. And there are so many of them that are written, so many that we have from, from all, through all these years. This one is the one that is most poignant to me. It touches my heart in such a deep place. But just listen, look at me and just listen first. Lincoln's original 1863 Thanksgiving proclamation came spiritually speaking at a very pivotal point in his life. During the first week of July of that year, 1863, the Battle of Gettysburg occurred, resulting in the loss of some 60,000 American lives. Four months later, in November, Lincoln delivered his famous Gettysburg Address. It was while Lincoln was walking among the thousands of graves there at Gettysburg that he committed his life to Jesus Christ. In the midst of that tragedy, he explained to a friend when I left Springfield to assume the presidency, I asked the people to pray for me. I was not a Christian. When I buried my son, the severest trial of my life, I was not a Christian. But when I went to Gettysburg and saw the graves of thousands of our soldiers, I then and there consecrated myself to Christ. Isn't that amazing? In the midst of that hurt, in the midst of that loss, in the midst of that chaos, in the midst of that pain, he committed his life to Jesus Christ. And four months after consecrating his life to Christ, he wrote the 1863 Thanksgiving Proclamation. And after that, Thanksgiving became a national holiday every year from this time forward. And here it is, you have it. It is the duty of nations as well as of men to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God, to confess their sins and transgressions and humble sorrow, yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon and to recognize the supreme truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history that those nations are blessed whose God is the Lord. We know that by his divine law, nations, like individuals, are subjected to punishments and chastisements in this world. May we not justly fear that the awful calamity of civil war, which now desolates the land, may be a punishment afflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins 
to the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people? What a man. What a godly man. How God had his hand on him as he wrote this. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. And what are the next words? What are they? Read them with me. What are they? But we have forgotten God. This was 1863. We have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Is that not a description of our country? Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace and too proud to pray to the God that made us. And then he says, it has seemed to me fit and proper that God should be solemnly, reverently, and gratefully acknowledged as with one heart and one voice by the whole American people. I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and all those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands to set apart and observed the last Thursday of November as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. Can you say amen? Can you say amen? Now, why did I not just read this to you? Why am I giving this to you? I'm giving this to you so that, so that you have it. So you have it. So that on Thanksgiving Day, no matter what it is that you're doing, you can read it. You can be reminded. And oh God, we will not be the people who do not say that we are thankful. We will not be the people who do not pray. We will not be the people who think we're so great that we don't need God. Amen? We will not be those people. And we will recognize and be thankful that we have America. We have the United States of America. Amen? Amen. And that we live in this land. And we will not ever let anyone take away from us how this country was founded. Amen? How this country was founded. Thank you, Lord God. God, we must be thankful on purpose, by choice. Acts 17, 28 says that we live and move and have our being in him, our being in him. We must praise on purpose. And I'm telling you what, the Bible speaks of a sacrifice of praise. And the, the more we do not feel like praising, the more we need to, the more we need to. And I promise you, if you will praise on purpose, I promise you, heaviness will lift from you. Sadness will lift from you. You will, uh, you will practice the presence of the Lord. First Chronicles 16, 34, First Chronicles 16, 34, this is where I started. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Can you just say that with me? He is good. Where you are right now, what it is that you're facing right now, what you can do or cannot do right now has not escaped him. It has not escaped him. It's not like COVID slipped through his fingers. He is sifting and still sifting. He is sifting 
And we are where we are by the grace of God. By the grace of God. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his faithfulness endures forever. So let me ask you, I always ask this before I read this particular scripture. Are you breathing? Are you breathing? Are you breathing? Let me hear. Are you breathing? Yeah, yeah, you're breathing. Psalm 150, 1 through 6. Psalm 150, 1 through 6. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to the abundance of his greatness. Praise him with trumpet, with harp and lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with stringed instruments and flute. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Praise him with loud cymbals. Here it is. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen? And it's amazing because one translation says, let everything that has breath and every breath of life praise the Lord. So can you just shout it with me? Praise the Lord. Praise one more time. Praise, praise the Lord. Lord. Praise the Lord. And I want to close by reading you Psalm 100 from the Passion Translation. Listen to this. Lift up a great shout of joy to the Lord. One more time, just shout it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Go ahead and do it. Everyone, everywhere. As you serve him, be glad and worship him. Sing your way into his presence with joy. And realize what this really means. We have the privilege of worshiping the Lord our God. For he's our creator and we belong to him and we are the people of his pleasure. You can pass through his open gates with the password of praise. Come right into his presence with thanksgiving. Come bring your thank offering to him and affectionately bless his beautiful name. For the Lord is always good and ready to receive you. He's so loving that it will amaze you so kind that it will astound you. And he is famous for his faithfulness toward all. Everyone knows our God can be trusted, for he keeps his promises to every generation. Amen? Every generation. Every generation. Heavenly Father, this is a challenging year, challenging. I look around this room, I see faces, I see face after face after face, challenge after challenge after challenge in this room. And I can't even see the faces on the other side of the camera. But this I know, we cannot do this without you, Lord. We cannot. And having it be an outside-in job, is just, it's not going to fix it. This has to be an inside-out job. We, we read about Abraham Lincoln. Oh, my God. He, he became president, asked people to pray for him. He was not a Christian. Not a Christian. Buried his son, who was dearly beloved to him, and was not a Christian. And yet, when he faced terrible pain and trial, when he walked through all those graves at Gettysburg, then he yielded. He yielded in a time of trouble. And then maybe you in this room, you may have been fighting this, but you know you need to yield. You need to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Or maybe you did this along the way like I did, and you know it's time that you need to rededicate all of your life to him. So if either of those is you, would you just raise your hand so I can see it? And we will pray. All right. I do not see hands in this room. Trusting if it all ends tonight, you're ready. You're absolutely ready. But pray with me because there are those who will be watching who perhaps have never made this decision. So just pray out loud with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I know I need a Savior. I need you, Jesus. I do believe that you are the Son of God that you came to this earth, lived a sinless life, went to Calvary for me, but 
that wasn't the end. You're alive. A living God who comes to live in me if I invite you in. I do that today. Jesus, you're my Savior. You're Lord of my life. Forgive me for every way that I have failed and sinned. Wash me clean, and I thank you for your redeeming love, and I thank you for the power of repentance. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Now, Heavenly Father, I pray over these in this room. I pray over those who will watch. Oh, God, I pray blessing over them. I don't know where they will celebrate Thanksgiving, but I am declaring whether they are alone or with loved ones, that they will celebrate Thanksgiving, that they will praise on purpose, and that they will have your heavenly perspective on why it is that we do what we do when we celebrate Thanksgiving. God, show us what it means to be living in Thanksgiving this year more than any other year in our lives. Now, Lord, I ask you to take them home safely to their places of rest. Give them sweet sleep, Lord. And Lord, you know, you know, I am profoundly thankful for them. And I just give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name.